Anyway, I want to talk about, I want to kind of go back to uh, an old subject. And in my subject, I'll touch on many old subjects. They're old in the sense that we've heard them before. But with Yahweh, he likes to repeat himself because we're slow. You know, it takes us a while to get it. Does anybody remember the four C's? The four C's, the letter C. Huh? Say. Don't remember. See, there are certain things when people speak a message that just stick with me. The four C's, the letter C. Four C's. Pastor Micah brought the message probably over a year ago. Again, you know, like I said today in class, time all kind of mushes together, and I might go find it, and it might be two years ago. <laughs> you know, I remember the four C's. Choose, clarify, change, and check. Well, I, like I said, when that message was brought forth, those stuck with me. And so I guess it's been about four or five weeks that I dug out my little piece of paper that said four C's and had those four words on it. And I kept, I'm, I like, I want to do this. I was going to present it at the beginning of a class. I was going to, you know, so it ended up being a message, kind of. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 24. Because the first of the four C's is to choose. So, of course, in Joshua 24, 14 and is where the infamous line is, choose you this day who you will serve. And as for my, me and my house, I, we will serve Yahweh. Okay, so that's like the infamous choose scripture. So we're going to look at Joshua 24, starting at verse 14 and going to um, verse 24. And we're going to look at the four C's as we do this. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye Yahweh. And if it seem evil unto you to serve Yahweh, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as far as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should ever forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. For Yahweh our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us all, preserved us in all the way therein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And Yahweh drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore we will also serve Yahweh, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve Yahweh, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive you, forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake Yahweh and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve Yahweh. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, Yahweh, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, he said, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto Yahweh, the God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, Yahweh our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So, let's recap a little bit here. Um, we have the Exodus. 
which, you know, Moses was raised up to deliver Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they were to go into a promised land. But because of some stuff that they did that was stupid, um, they ended up wandering, that's the book of Numbers, for 40 years. Well, they actually wandered for 38, but they were 40 years not going into the promised land. So the book of Joshua is them going into the promised land and the battles that they had to fight to conquer it, to inhabit it, and also talks about how the land was divided and who got what. Okay. So note, though, from the Exodus to here is a lot of years. Okay. So the Exodus, the book of Exodus covers... 120 years, Moses' birth and his death. Moses lived to be 120 years old. So the book of Exodus covers 120 years. Then the book of Numbers covers 40 years. Now they're finished taking the land, which I didn't look at, was another many years. So we're looking at a lot of years from the beginning of Moses' birth to where Joshua is, okay? So now Joshua, everything's being settled, and he puts out this proposal. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye Yahweh. So note that they are still in idolatry. They're still serving, trying to serve Yahweh and the gods of their fathers not just in Egypt, but on the other side of the flood, okay? And if it seem evil to you to serve Yahweh, if it seems no good for you to serve Yahweh, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. So he's telling the people, y'all need to make up your mind who will be your God. If serving Yahweh doesn't seem good to you, okay. He's not fussing now. He's saying, okay. But make a choice. Is it the God of your fathers or the God of the Amorites whose land we dwell in? Make up your mind, but I'll let you know my mind. Me and my house, we're serving Yahweh. Okay. Now, to serve means keep, to keep, to labor, work, become servant or worshiper. So he's telling them, first he pleads with them to fear Yahweh and to serve him in sincerity and in truth. He even directs them at how you would serve Yahweh in sincerity and in truth. But if that's not, don't work for you, okay, pick who you're going to serve. Picking up in verse 16, and the people answered and said, Elohim forbid that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. For Yahweh, our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the ways therein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And Yahweh drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwell in the land. Therefore, will we also serve Yahweh, for he is our God. So the people are saying, what? Why would we serve some other God 
when Yahweh is the one who did all these things for us. Okay, but they have idolatry. But they're making a statement, why would we forsake Yahweh when he's done all these things for us? So the verses 14 and 15 were, make your choice, choose. They're making their choice based on what Yahweh has done for them thus far. And they're not going, they're talking about what he's done for us. You know, as we went forth and conquered the land, it was Yahweh that drove the inhabitants out. It was Yahweh that did all these miraculous signs in Egypt. It was Yahweh. So they're making their decision based on the things of Yahweh. So do we today. There are people that sit in the midst of the congregation, and this is not inclusive. This is all-inclusive. You know, I'm not talking just to the congregation of Yeshua here. I'm talking about the church of Yahweh that sit in the midst with their serving of Yahweh but mixed with idolatry. And Yahweh is asking them to make a choice. Choose which God, who you will serve, because you can't serve them all. And we'll reflect on, well, Yahweh has done this for me and done that for me because Yahweh has done stuff for us. But note what Joshua says because they said, well, we remember what Yahweh did for us, and so we also will serve him for he is our God. And Joshua says unto the people, you cannot serve Yahweh. For he is an holy God, he is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Now, when we first hear that, we're, you know, we think, well, wait a minute. Yeshua came, died, so that he does forgive. But we got to keep it in the context of the scripture that's being set forth. He's telling them, because note he said in 14, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and truth. But now he's saying, you can't serve Yahweh. He's talking about how they cannot serve Yahweh as they are. Like it can't continue to go on like this. Like, you know, the scripture, the commandments say, thou shall have no other gods before me. And we, Sister Denise brought a message, and there was multiple words on, on explaining that scripture. It doesn't mean, you know, besides, some scriptures say besides me, uh, before me. That is talking about you cannot serve Yahweh as you are. He will not be one of many or number one of many. He will only be your God if he's the one and only that's what he's saying. Not that you can't have any other gods before me. Like, it's okay as long as I'm first. You can't have any gods. He's got to be the one and only God. And we look in the scriptures and see the things that Yahweh has promised us, promised his people. They're based on the fact that Yahweh is your God exclusively so when we're falling short and Yahweh is not it's appearing to us to do the things that he has said that he would do we have to question ourselves. the exam you know the uh, check of the four C's the checking I have to examine myself to see is Yahweh my only God Exodus verse, t chapter 20, verse 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am, for I, Yahweh, thy God, am a jealous God. So just as Joshua was saying, you can't, you can't serve Yahweh as you are because Yahweh is holy and he's jealous. So there has to be a change made. 
in order for you to follow through with your profession that I serve Yahweh. Matthew 6.24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve Yahweh and mammon. Usually that mammon, we say, oh, it's money. But mammon is a variance. An inordinate desire of gaining and possessing wealth covetedness. That variance could be anything. Anything you desire is wealth to you. It's not necessarily money. Some people treasure other stuff other than money. But it's in a variance that you deify. It's something you lift up like a god. So your pursuit of money, pleasures, Anything that you would put, at, deify it. And sometimes we can't see that, but when we make certain sacrifices, um, you know, back uh, before they got all this technology and you had to be at home to watch your show, you couldn't DVR it, you couldn't, you know, record it on VHS or, you know, you had to physically be there. People would just... If that was their show, it was like they were home, they were, don't call me, you know, they couldn't be bothered, they wouldn't answer the phone, they didn't call, it was like, wait till my show is over, you know. That's your God. When you're doing stuff like that, you've deified that. Somebody who gets a new car, you know, it's don't touch it, don't, uh, you know, are your feet clean, you know, you got it. don't smoke in my car, don't eat in my car. You've deified it. You've exalted it up. Um, you, got, you know, always carry the rag in your pocket and wiping off every little dirt spot. Thou shalt fear Yah Yahweh thy God and serve him and swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For Yahweh thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of Yahweh thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. This is Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 15. Same thing that Joshua is saying to the people now. Thou shalt fear Yahweh thy God and serve him and swear by his name. This swear in the proper text of the you know, the, the root of the word means properly to be complete and shall swear be complete by his name. The generic, which is the one that we use often, means to seven oneself, the number seven. And that's where they get, when you make an oath, you say it seven times. You know, like, uh, you know, whether it's marriage or divorce, you just got to say it seven times and that makes it a done deal. It, so it's the thought of seven oneself. I found that interesting because it's the number seven. But note here, you know, because sometimes we'll look at and we'll think about, well, the idolatry in the scriptures, you know, we know that type of idolatry for the most part, is gone. You know, nobody's got these huge statues and they're not worshiping Zeus and in that form, okay? But he says in Deuteronomy, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. So the people that are around about us in this country, other countries have their own, you know, uh, traditions and things. We shouldn't take on their gods. So with that, I just want to throw out these things that we do, you know, uh, stress relief. You know, the world is stressing me. My job is stressing me. Kids are stressing me. I need a drink. 
that's the gods of the people which are around about you. That's their method of de-stressing. That's their idolatry. Because Yahweh's supposed to be your all in all. He's supposed to be your source of peace. Smoking. You know, people will watch certain or listen to certain kinds of music or, you know, whatever that is that the world around you does to get rid of stress, to relax. If you're doing those things, you're taking on their idolatry because Yahweh isn't your God because you didn't turn to him to, you know, in the stressful situation, in the situation that's frustrating you to get or to even for relaxation, to get peace. You're turning to something else. And usually it's to what the people do, what's common among the people. So that's what he says here. Ye shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people which are round about you. And he says why? Because the, if you're looking at Deuteronomy 16, 15, the first part of it is in parentheses. Parentheses. So let's say I take out the part that's in parentheses for right now, and I read it. Thou shalt fear Yahweh thy God and serve him, and shall swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you, lest the anger of Yahweh thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. So when you do that, the anger of Yahweh is kindled against thee. What's in parentheses is why. Yahweh will do this because he's a jealous God. He's not going to share you. Think of relationships. You know, especially intimate relationships. You know, you're not supposed to share your husband with anybody else. Not just females. You know, even his friends. It's like he's exclusive to you. Your wife is exclusive to you. Now, I'm not talking about lording over. You know, you get jealous when they begin to give their attention or their affection somewhere else. Yahweh is the same way. We have entered into this binding a relationship with him, and he expects that intimacy, and he's not going to share you. He's not going to share you. Instead, he will destroy you. <laughs> but it's not personal, because he's destroying all the wicked. You just have joined the wicked. So he's going to destroy you with the wicked. If you forsake Yahweh and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. Okay, pay attention to that. So that means you're in a relationship and he's done you good. Remember what the people said. Oh, wow, no, we would not. Elohim forbid we will serve Yahweh because he did this and he did that. All the good that Yahweh did. So he done good. And then they turn and serve strange gods. He will do you hurt and consume you. Hebrews says, for if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. This is saying the same thing. If after Yahweh had done you good, he saved you, you know the truth, and you decide to dismiss it, and willfully go in your own direction, there remaineth no more sacrifice for you, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. In other words, Yahweh isn't necessarily turning on you personally. You have linked yourself with the wicked, and therefore you will receive the judgment of the wicked. Okay? 
verse 31 in Hebrews 10 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It should be. You should be afraid. But as we're looking at, the, at John, and today we're looking at uh, Judas and the betrayal when Yahshua is talking about it, he said, oh, the one whom I dip and hand it to, and Judas is sitting right next to him, and Yahshua dips and hands it to him, Judas, little bells should be going off in Judas's head. And then when Yahshua turns to him and says, go and do what you do quickly, it's like, I know what you're about to do. There should have been a fear that would come upon him, but he, his heart was so sold out that he, it wasn't fearful that he would fall into the hands of the living God. And when judgment came upon him, when he realized what he had done, his grief took him to suicide. Um, still in Hebrews 10.35, cast not away therefore your confidence, your faith, because if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, he's talking about faith. Don't cast away your faith, which hath great recompense of reward. If you remain faithful and true to Yahweh, there is great reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of Elohim, you might receive the promise. So he's, the writer is trying to encourage you, don't fall away. You know, don't fall away, but remain faithful and have patience because Yahweh will come through. He will come through. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. It's talking about the second coming of Yeshua. Right now, it's a shall come. He shall come, but the shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of souls. We're not the drawbackers. We're not the one that's turned. That we're not the one who brings other things into the relationship that we have with Yahweh. These other gods. The source of my comfort. The source of my relaxation. The source of my... They don't supersede Yahweh. They're not named amongst us. Back into Joshua, verse 21. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, we will serve Yahweh. So Joshua asked them, you know, verse 14, Fear Yahweh, serve him in sincerity and truth. Don't just serve him any kind of way, but in sincerity and in truth. You know, put away the gods of your father that your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. And if it seem evil unto you to serve Yahweh, make a choice. Choose. In verse 17 and 18, he's clarifying. For Yahweh our God, it, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage and which did. So he goes on talking about we are acknowledging, we're clarifying who the God is we want. Right? We're making a choice and then we're clarifying that this is, this is that God. And then in 19 through 21, it's the are you sure? Now the are you sure isn't a part of the four C's, but it's the are you sure? Like you made your decision, and now are you sure? Because he said, you know, you can't serve Yahweh like you are. You have to change. You have to change, which is one of the seeds. You have to change. So you have to choose. It's clarified. And then there's the change. You have to change. You can't not serve Yahweh, for he's holy and jealous. Therefore, you have to make sure that you 
are sure of the choice. Yeshua talked about count the cost. You know, he, he understood not everybody can do this. Now, anybody who wants to do this can do this because Yahweh does it through you. The, the point is we can't do this. You know, that's why the scriptures tells us it's him that even gives us the desire to want to do. And then he gives us the power to do. So it all comes from him. But I have to have faith in that. I have to believe that that's the case. I have to believe that what Yahweh said is true. And I have to stand on those things and not let these other things that we're labeling idolatry come into the picture. Or I'm going to have the wrath of Yahweh against me because I have joined myself with the wicked. Even though Yahweh's there in the picture, he's just not exclusive. Okay? The scripture talks about in the last days, in several places, but one of the scriptures talks about how there'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. See, it didn't say they don't love God. <laughs> they just love other stuff more. So guess where those people are? They're in the church. They love yeah. They just love other stuff more. So they're in the church. These people are in the church. They were in the midst of the congregation of the people. These idolaters, these ones who thought they could serve Yahweh and other gods. They're in the congregation. Then at the end, he gives the check. Okay, now you are witnessing because the people say, oh, no, no, we want to serve Yahweh. So he says, you are witness against yourself that ye have chosen Yahweh to serve him. In other words, all the congregation is saying, we will, and he's saying, you're witnessing against yourself. Everybody's witnessing that you all have made this profession that you're going to serve Yahweh. Then he says to him, okay, so now here's what you have to do. Put away the strange gods which are among you. When you look at the book of Acts, chapter 15, after they go to the council, now Paul has been putting forth his ministry to the Gentiles. He's been presenting Yeshua, the gospel of Yeshua. And people have been receiving salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit. You have Jews, Judaizers, who go in, and because they're not doing certain things that they felt were written in the law, now note that this is about salvation. This isn't about they shouldn't do it. It's about to be saved. The big issue is circumcision. They weren't getting circumcised, therefore they were not saved. So Paul has a meeting with the elders in Jerusalem to say, you know, this can't be. So their conclusion was, okay, this is what we'll tell these people. This is what you have to do. And there's a little list. And that little list is all about idolatry. In other words, you can come just as you are. You don't have to get circumcised or any of these other, go through ritual baptisms and cleansings and the things that the law said. You don't have to do any of that, but you can't be worshiping your idols. You have to forsake your idols, come into the synagogue and be taught. This is not anything new. It was said in Deuteronomy, and I'm sure I can find it in Genesis. It's being said here, Joshua is saying it to the people. You have to forsake all the other gods. You have to put away your idolatry. When Isaac, is that Isaac? No, Jacob. When Jacob was living with his uncle, and got him his two wives and the concubines, and finally he's going to go back home. 
I'm sure you all know that his uncle was an idolater. He had foreign gods. He worshipped other gods. Now, that didn't mean Jacob did, but he allowed his wives to do this. He may have, you know, to appease his women. Men, take note of that. Do not appease your women and forsake your God. So when he was coming to a place of now he's entering, he's going back home unto his father's household, Abraham's household, the father of faith, you note what he does. He makes them all get rid of their idols. Y'all got to get rid of all your idols. We cannot cross over until all the idols are gone. So it's not nothing new. Yahweh has always demanded that of his people. We have to get rid of the idols, whatever those things are, whatever you put such value on that you will forsake your Bible studies, your church time, your, you know, time for, uh, you know, to commune with the saints you know, for going to feast, whatever excuses, you, you know, that anything that supersedes that or supersedes your right living, you know, you forsake your prayer time, whatever is occupying your time, whether it's, it doesn't have to be stuff, it could be people, your friends, maybe more intimate relationships. If those things are interfering with your walk with Yahweh, they are idols, and Yahweh is saying, make your choice. And if he is your choice, then this is what you have to do. Put away now. Put away the strange gods which are among you and incline your heart unto Yahweh, the God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, Yahweh our God will we serve in his voice will we obey? Note as we've gone over these things, the strange gods which are among you. So he's talking about the strange gods which are among you, but he also talked about the gods of the people which are around you and the gods which your fathers served. So these gods can come from different sources. Some of it's training, like the, their fathers, their heritage brought in idolatry. And if you look and go through the Old Testament, they never actually got out of that. They never got out of it. You know, they would get, have seasons, but always it, idolatry looks good. It has something better for Something better. You know, if you want to look at, you know, we can look at the worldly things, but what about false doctrines? They look good. They're pleasing. Once saved, always saved. That's pleasing. I can do what I want and still be saved. I might not have all the rewards that I might have if I did, was sold out altogether, but I'm still making it in. Or what about prosperity message? That sounds good too. Right? I serve Yahweh and he gives me stuff. That sounds like mammon. That Yahweh is, I'm calling Yahweh my God, but it's really the mammon, the reward that I'm after. I don't really want Yahweh, I want the reward. Idolatry. And there's Christmas and Easter. They look good. They sound good. And it would seem logical to how they even came into the church. Well, we're just trying to, you know, make, but you're compromising. And now all this idolatry has come into the church. Yahweh is asking his people to make a choice. Family curses, you know, um, I don't necessarily like the word curse because it's not like, you know, you can't, you don't, you don't have to fall victim to family curses. What they really are are habits 
that you see family members doing, like alcoholism and all that, it's taught to you. You know, abuse. You know, if you were abused, usually you would figure you're abused, you don't like it, that you wouldn't be an abuser. But a lot of abused become abusers because it's taught, it's a taught behavior to them. So in Yahweh, you don't have to have, bring those things along. But a lot of times, our idolatry, whatever that is, alcoholism, you know, what, drug addictions, all of that that you can look and say, well, mom did it, grandma did it, granddad did it, this one, you know. It's trained behavior. You would see that they did it under stress or, you know, that that was their, their coping mechanisms or to turn off the world, okay? Yahweh is supposed to be your coping mechanism. So it's idolatry. The people in conclusion said, Yahweh, our God, will we serve? And his voice will we obey? Now, if you continue reading the book, and I'm talking about the Bible, you will find that they lied or forgot, I'll, I'll be nice, they forgot and continued on with their idolatry. So you will hear again and again and again through the scriptures in different shapes and forms, Yahweh making this proclamation to his people, and he's still doing it today. Today he's sending out his word. He's telling us what true discipleship is all about. He's telling us what it means when we look in Exodus and it says, Thou shalt have no other gods beside me, that that's exclusive, that he's exclusive. He's telling, I mean, just here in this church, and I know Yahweh, so I know he's telling his people everywhere the same thing, what it means to be a true disciple. And to be a true disciple is you have to forsake all the idolatry, all of it to be a true disciple. There is a learning curve. Yahweh is gracious. But if you don't do this, your reward will be punishment with the wicked. Everything you see that Yahweh says he's going to do to the wicked will be your reward. Your reward, your half-heartedness will be punishment with the wicked. That's why Yahshua said there will be weeping and gnashing. Excuse me, he said great weeping and gnashing of teeth because, you know, you thought you were good to go, but because you were not, he wasn't exclusive. You will have your part with the wicked. So we need to remember these four C's, and it's because it's something that we should do every day. I should every day wake up and make Yahweh my choice. I should clarify how far am I willing to go for this? Because if I'm not willing to go too far, I should make another choice. And then I need to make the change necessary to live up to the choice. If Yahweh is my choice, then as Joshua said, I made now, not tomorrow, right now, put this stuff away from you. And then tomorrow you have to do it again because the stuff has a tendency to want to come back. And then you check. You examine yourself, your views, your thoughts, making sure everything is lining up correctly. If you have questions, you ask. Ask pastors. Ask people that you have put around you. Ask Yahweh. And then the next day, you start all over again. Today, I make a choice. Yahweh, you're my choice. And this is what I'm willing to make to shore up that choice, what I'm willing to do. And I'm willing to change my views, my thoughts, to line up with what you say I need to do. And I'm checking all along the way. And the next day, the same thing. And the next day, the same thing. It's a daily thing. It's not a one and done. That's part of the problem in the church as well. People think it's a one and done. That's one saved, always saved. Yeah, we don't do one and done. It's every day. Today, today, now, 
He always speaks in the present. And then once tomorrow comes, today, now. Choose you this day. So in the morning, choose you this day. Six months from now, choose you this day. Whom you will serve. Because actually, if you think about it, we'll be doing a Yahweh thing a few days, and then I did a me thing. Right? Oh, I guess you chose you that day and not Yahweh. See, we do it, but now I want us to be conscious of what we're doing. So when I choose a me day, here's the other God, me. I've idolized me. I deified me and my wants and my desires. And I'll get back to Yahweh tomorrow. I'm going to say my peace. I'm tired of putting up with so-and-so's abuse. I'm going to say my peace today and get all in myself. That's my choice today. Today I serve me. I'm going to the bar. I'm going clubbing. I'm, going to, I'm choosing me today. We need to choose every day. Because the me you choose today, if you choose me today and something happened to you, five years of Yahweh and one me day get you put out. So we need to be serious about this. So praise Yahweh. Because there's still salvation in it. Yeah. Uh -huh.